now we're thinking that heart rate actually drives chronic heart failure, it actually drives remodeling, it actually promotes atherosclerosis, and it actually promotes ischemia. So this cascade of consequences of an elevated heart rate puts the ventricle at risk. It turns out that the newest agent that we can use to target heart rate approved in the calendar year of 2015 by the FDA is a compound known as Evabradine. It's a unique agent because it has only one functionality. It interrupts the F channels in the atrium, and in so doing, the consequence is only one thing, slowing the heart rate. Now, when given to people with a resting heart rate greater than 70, despite being on a beta blocker, it actually made a significant difference. That difference was seen in patients who had principally class two and three heart failure. It was principally in those with reduced ejection fraction and exclusively in those with normal sinus rhythm. When you add a vabradine on top of the beta blocker, this is what you get, a 26% reduction in the necessity for hospitalizations for heart failure. No real benefit on mortality, so we shouldn't think of this as a way to prolong life, but we should think of this as a way to modify this hospitalization experience. Now the next new therapy is one that has generated tremendous excitement. This is an effort to upset the foundation of heart failure by introducing a new idea, a new concept. This requires us to digress for a moment and just think about physiology yet again. You remember the RAS cascade, and you know that the consequences of this cascade is the elaboration of angiotensin II. And angiotensin II, when it is present in the cardiovascular circulation, leads to an upregulation in neurohormonal activation in the sympathetic nervous system. It has influences on the kidney. It leads to aldosterone release. It leads to influences on the vasculature through an increase in oxidative stress. And importantly, it has an influence on the heart, which is maladaptive, pathologic, with ventricular remodeling hypertrophy. So what we've done over the years is to interrupt the influences of angiotensin II, which has been for the good and has led to good outcomes. But we've always known, though not been able to manipulate the concept, that there's a yin-yang that the myocyte sees. There is the burden of neurohormonal activation, but there's also the benefit of an endogenous system mediated through natriuretic peptides and cyclic GMP that attenuates this burden of vasoconstriction and remodeling. So here is the model in the human. By bringing together these two concepts, the ARB, Valsartan, and Secubitril, you can see what happens. The Valsartan is a prototypical angiotensin receptor antagonist. The Secubitril interrupts the breakdown of the natriuretic peptide, makes more of it available so this process of upregulating cyclic GMP can occur. Now, one little caveat here is that this is one of the first times where there's an important distinction between following your patient's progress with BNP versus NT pro BNP, because it turns out that BNP is likely to go up in the setting of Secubitril. Only NT pro BNP will vary accordingly with the patient's clinical status. So keep that in mind as you're looking at using that biomarker in the setting of this drug. When that study was done, we all got very enthused when these results became available. We were struck to see a significant reduction on top of ACE inhibitors in heart failure hospitalization, 21% relative risk reduction, and death from cardiovascular causes, a 20% relative risk reduction, and this is on top of ACE inhibitors. Clearly a home run. The number zeros behind the p-value is almost too many to count. This really is a novel profound, important statement in cardiovascular research.